so I want to talk to you today um, really about some very general topics. And you know, I've never been a plenary speaker, so I looked it up. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a wide-ranging talk, so it's going to be rather wide-ranging. The first part is going to be rather heavy. Um, and it, I, I want you to think about a few things that I'm going to bring up. And I want you to go home with them and chew on them. Um, you're staring at the wall in the shower, or if you're, you're wandering through your yard, just thinking, well, these are the kinds of things I want you to think about. Um, and I threw up a couple pictures here just to give you the, I always throw up gratuitous Iceland pictures whenever I can. Um, so they're dealing with the same kind of coastal issues that we're dealing with. Um, it's funny to think about because we get so very myopic when we start thinking about what's happening because of what's happening to us. Um, but these coastal issues are happening all over the world, right? Everywhere from Australia to China to Indonesia, they're all dealing with these coastal problems. Um, and I want you to start thinking about these coastal problems, not just here, um, but this really is a global problem um, because we're dealing with a global issue, sea levels coming up. Um, we'll talk a bit about sea level today. Um, but let's start with sort of what I want you to think about. So some, I'm, if I look up at the slides every once in a while, it's because I did this very late last night. I might be surprised by what I put up there, but it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, so a couple of things I want you to think about is this, this idea of equilibrium, so stasis and change. This is a very sort of broad topic. Um, it goes for everything from climate change to chemistry to, to your bank account, right? There's an equilibrium state in just about any system we can think of. And we can start quantifying that system using some different kinds of, of parameters, some measurements. Um, so we're going to think about that a little bit. Um, we'll talk about some of the coastal processes. Primarily, I want to talk about barrier islands. We're standing on one. How barrier islands behave, um, how we know they behave, um, and sort of some of the anatomy. Um, and then I want to talk about okay, what do we do about it. So what are some what are some answers? And we'll go through some very some, some generic answers. Um, so bits and pieces that are pulled out of some of my uh, intro classes. So it starts feeling if I'm insulting your intelligence, you can frown. If I'm not insulting your intelligence, you can be happy. Yeah. Um, but it'll be a little bit of both. Um, okay, so equilibrium, it's a really interesting concept. Um, the idea that there's a homeostasis, so your body is at a homeostasis equilibrium right now. Um, you're not sick, hopefully, right? You're not, you're not overheated, you're not underheated, right? You're at a, a homeostatic stasis. And the idea that we have things that push us around in this homeostatic envelope, if you will. So you, know, you can get hot and still be healthy. You can get cold and still be healthy. Um, we have this idea of equilibrium state. So if we start thinking about this as a ball, this is, this is a classic representation. It's a ball in sort of a, a pocket. Right? So this ball in this pocket can get pushed up and down the walls of that pocket and still return to this equilibrium state, this happy state. Um, at least happy for this particular time and place. Now, what are the axes here? That's up to you. Right, for baryons, let's talk about baryons, and we'll bring this, this, these will pop up again, here and there during the talk. Um, we can talk about, you know, this is the current state, or the current placement of the barrier island, and this could be anything from sea level rise to sediment transport. We can put all sorts of things in there. Um, this is two-dimensional, so we can think in two different ways. All right, so what do we do with this? All right, so it means we can push this ball up and either side of that, that, that pocket, and it's still going to slide back and stay in that pocket. So we can think of this as seasonal changes, hurricanes, things like that will push the ball up and down that wall. But if all things remain the same, we don't keep pushing, it's going to return back to that state, that happy equilibrium state. Right? So if we're talking about placement, the baryon is not going to move. The seasonal changes of sand movement, that will, will change the beach face, but the beach will return to normal. We'll talk about how that fits. Um, so let's talk about the next obvious thing. What happens when we move to a new equilibrium state? And this is, this, is, this is where I want you to chew on this. Because the Earth is constantly pushing different places into different equilibrium states. And if we think about the Earth as a whole, it has an equilibrium state. right? And it moves through different equilibrium states. I'll give you some examples in a second. But if we keep pushing it up, we move up to the top of this hill. right? So we move this un, the, the uneven or the unstable. Equilibrium state, this is what we refer to as a tipping point. Right? So whenever you hear that tipping point in the news, when you hear about temperature and things like that, this is what we're talking about. Because what happens if you just tap it a little bit more, it's going to move into a new pocket, right? into a new equilibrium state. So whether that equilibrium state is good for us or good for something else, that's, that's up to debate, it's up to research. 
but we can do this sort of change. And then we start thinking about moving between equilibrium states, and the Earth does this. Think about glacial cycles. So I'm a geologist by trade, so I tend to think in these big, that's why I study geology, I think about big picture things. Right, so we move in between glacial and interglacials. So there's different equilibrium states between those two. Sometimes we're happy in a glacial cycle, so the Earth starts feeding back and keeping us in that glacial cycle, and then something changes and pushes it out of that pocket, and we move into an interglacial. We're in an interglacial right now, Interglacials tend to be much shorter in terms of time than our glacial periods. We spend a lot of time in the cold and a little bit of time in the, in the heat as it is in this glacial cycle, at least since the Pleistocene. Um, so moving between these equilibrium states, it requires some, some pushing, right? Either the Earth is pushing, the tilt of the Earth is pushing, or what we find more and more, depending on what you're thinking of, this equilibrium state anthropogenically, we're starting to figure out we can push it too. Right, so we can add some momentum to that pushing. Right, so keep these in mind, because we're going to come back to these ideas a little bit more. All right, so now, equilibrium in 3D and Doctor Who is not, that's not a, it's not a coincidence, I picked that picture out. Right, so we can think of this in three dimensions. So this is where it gets really interesting, because we can think of this in multivariate dimensions. Now it's less like just a two-dimensional sort of ball rolling up and down a hill, it's more like, pinball games, if you played those, <laughs> I'm also aging myself there probably, um, or pool, right? So if your pool table isn't level, and we've all played on that pool table, it's not level, hopefully, and you watch the ball do weird things, we can think of this as a three-dimensional plane of multivariate things that are happening to move this ball around this three-dimensional space. So now these pockets, now we have to put you know, more holes in there, so there's another equilibrium state. Right, we can see how different ways we can push that ball in and out of that hole into another one. Now this is, this is the fun part, right? Because now we're in multivariate world. We can think about temperature. We can think about sediment loading. We can think about glaciers. We can think about aliens. Whatever you want to add in there. <laughs> Anything we can think of that might push you out of one stable state into another stable state can happen. Now you can think of this in terms of your checking account, right? Different costs. Different, different things coming in for money will push your ball around this three-dimensional plane to move you from equilibrium states of, you know, I'm super rich to I'm not so super rich. Right, so we can move through this and we can think of this in all sorts of ways. And this is what I always invite my students to do is add this into your life and just start thinking in this way of how do I move between equilibrium states and what can I do to sort of control that? How can you move the ball and how can you not move the ball? In other words, what do you have control of and what do you not have control of? Um, so in this case, I'm sort of giving this example. We have sediment inputs, we've got sea level. All these things are going to influence where our coastal systems and how they function, where they are, and, and things like everything from beach erosion to beach um, aggradation to building beaches. All right, so just an example of another equilibrium state. Um, this is the, the mid-Cretaceous, so this is, this is Michael Crichton's because all the dinosaurs are actually Cretaceous dinosaurs, it should be called Cretaceous part. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> right. this, is, this is our Cretaceous world, right? So just look at the continental locations. Look at where the oceans are. Look at Florida. You're a beautiful, tropical blue ocean. You look like Bahamas. Um, and I will argue that actually Florida spent most of its existence underwater, right? And it's, we're in a very odd time here because we're out of water. Most of geologic time, Florida has been underwater. Um, but look at... We're having the same beach processes, barrier islands moving, sediment transport, longshore transport, all it's happening, which just happening in Kansas, right? So we have a very different stable equilibrium in the Cretaceous, right? But this is stable. This lasted for hundreds, well, probably fifties of millions of years for this particular picture. It's a long time, right? It was in that pocket and it was happy in that pocket. CO2 in the atmosphere was 1200 ppm. It was much warmer. We had tropical plants in Alaska, right? So we had a very, very different setup, a very, very different stable equilibrium, but it was stable. So what's my point? Well, we're in a stable equilibrium now. We're in a pocket now. We were in a pocket then. Something pushed this out of the pocket. Um, it looks like we're pushing out of our pocket now into something new. Um, just to give you some more perspectives, this is the neogene. Um, so here we are about 23 million years ago, and notice where Florida still is, underwater. We've got some Ocala in a beautiful island. 
right? So this is another stable equilibrium, and this is with sea levels about 33 feet higher. Um, so we're pushing, and we think we're pushing towards at least three feet by 2100, right? So sea level is coming up. How fast is still, that's, that's the question. And we'll talk about that and what that means in a second. All right, so let's sort of talk about our system and sort of get to the coastal processes. So I didn't want to blow through that too fast because I wanted to like blow your minds, right? It's, it's big, it's big thinking about how these equilibriums work. And they scale up and they scale down. But it's good to think in these terms because you can start doing some planning. You can start doing some thinking of, of what you can do in your particular pocket and with your ball. All right, so this is, this is a great image. I totally stole this from one of my textbooks, right? So this gives us our coastal systems really generalized for the US. And what we see, we see a couple different kinds of coastlines. We've got these resistant coastlines. So if you go up to Maine, anybody who's been up to Acadia National Park, granite, rock, sitting on the coastline, very pretty. Not very good to sunbathe on, right? But it's very pretty. You move down the east coast, you've got a lot of this non-resistant sedimentary rock. So we end up with a lot of beaches, right? This is where a lot of our sediments produced, at least for the east coast, is coming out of rivers, coming out of this midsection. And then finally down here in Florida, interestingly enough, look at most of Florida. We're actually mostly resistant sedimentary limestone and, and coquina. So just walk down a little bit further from here, you'll start seeing hardened coastline rock, right? So we have some sedimentary, but we have a lot of limestone. All the way around, interesting enough, up into the panhandle, you start seeing the limestone die off and the Mississippi takes over and starts coating a lot of that resistant rock with, with sediment. Um, so look at where we are, the interesting part. We're, this is a really interesting place to be, right? All sorts of water, and we found it with the turtles. It's really interesting with the turtles we worked with. Um, we get turtles from Cuba and we get turtles from North Carolina, right? Nowhere else in Florida do you get that. Go south of here, they're all cute. If you go north of here, they're all from North Carolina. So we get this weird mix here in this, this sort of part of Florida that makes it really interesting. Well, part of that is our beaches are very interesting. There's just all sorts of neat things that happen in this section of, of the United States, this section of Florida. All right, so the other thing to note here is we've got numbers, right? Whoops, we've got numbers. Hopefully I'll do that once or twice. The negative numbers indicate erosion, so a net loss of sand per year. Sand's moving. And in the next slide, I'll show you that longshore transport, which you probably remember vaguely from college or high school. If you teach it, you remember it. Right, longshore transport, beaches are rivers of sand. They move constantly. What we're going to find out is the thing we're standing on, right? This barrier island is moving. And they're meant to move, right? They're meant to be mobile because they respond to equilibrium pushes. Right, so we have net erosion in some places, interestingly enough, look here. Just on the southern coast, right in the bight, right, we're actually a net gain of sand. So we receive sand from up north and we have a net influence of a gain of sand down here. Um, go further south and it's net loss just about everywhere, except in a few spots in the U.S. it's a net loss. Where does all the sand go? Well, we export a lot of our west coast sand to Mexico. And this sand ended up going down to Mexico as well. So it continues down south towards the equator. All right, so keep this in mind. We're in that gain in sand here. So we should have a sand budget that's added, adding sand to our budget and, and providing us with more, more aggregational material. All right, so if you remember your longshore transport, we have a longshore current developed by this sort of constant wave action. And it's a constant motion of sand particles moving onto the beach and then off, but it's always in this unidirectional way. Right? So we move sand from north to south. Right? So sand is flowing along our coast from north to south. Um, so keep that in mind that we have this constant flow of sand, at least in natural beaches. Right? So when we start doing things to them, then we start interrupting this pattern of longshore current. All right, so if we look at how the sand develops here. Um, what, we, what we often think about is our beaches. These beaches tend to be part of barrier islands. Um, so they're really common along the East Coast. We have lots of barrier islands. I'll show you some examples. Um, they're common here. We just don't think of them the same way because you don't have to take a bridge out to them all the time. At least sometimes you do. Um, but generally think about it. When you drive across the ditch, right? one side or the other, there's that, that intercoastal, that is the separation of our barrier islands from our, our main coastline. And these barrier islands behave in a protective manner. They're trying to help us. 
right? They're protecting us against the heaviest wave action of the ocean. So this interior area is protected by the, the presence of these barrier islands. Um, but they migrate, right? These things move through time. I'll show you some examples of this movement. Um, but this barrier island and the geologic sense is moving, right? And it's responding to some stressors. Um, the two stressors really are sediment budget, which is smaller, and sea level. That's the big one. So the wave action that's produced by that sea level change moves the barrier out. So sea level's coming up. Our barrier island right now is trying to trans, I'm sorry, regress. It's trying to move back onto, onto land. So it's moving towards the shore. Hopefully I got that right. All right, so what's a barrier island? So here's the boring part, right? You can tune out if you've seen this. Um, the Barry Island built, this is a very generic island, right? So we have the ocean beach. This is the part that interfaces with the ocean. Um, we've got our dune system, and the dune systems obviously around here vary. It's where they tend to like to build houses and develop, because it's the nicest view. Um, you're right on the beach. You get a, a very beautiful view of the beach. Um, if you walk out here, this dune system that has not been built on is just covered in plants. Right? So those plants are helping to stabilize the dune, but you get a big enough storm, not even the plants can help you, right? Um, they'll help some, but these, these dunes are built up and they store sand. We're going to see that in a second. All they're essentially doing is storing sand for the beach, just on a long-term basis. This is your, your deep, this is your 401k of sand. Right? That's where the, the sand you don't touch unless something really bad happens. Right? It's the beach sand that tends to be your checking account that washes in and out. We'll look at that in a second. Um, we have uh, the barrier flat. That's, that's sort of what we're standing on right now is this flat area that sits behind the dune system, and then we have wetlands of various sorts, these salt marshes, these low marshes that sit behind us. Um, these things are interesting because they produce peat, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, all right, and then a lagoon system sits even further behind that. We don't really have a lagoon along our barrier islands. We tend to have the intercoastal, which sort of looks like our lagoon and behaves a lot like a lagoon. It's just not as, as low lying, so it doesn't have the same body of water we would see in a lagoon. All right, so just, I think I just literally explained this. You yeah, grass area, grasses, protecting from this rock storms. Here's the interesting part. All right, so as these dunes move, as these bear rounds move, we can find evidence of this. Um, so here's, here's our key bed here, this sort of brown part here, that's peat. It's developed in salt marshes, it's developed in, in, in wetlands, it's used to flavor your scotch, right? So peat, builds itself up in these wetlands, and we know it builds in wetlands because we can find it there. Um, it builds on the back part of this dune system. So as the dune moves through time, so you can sort of see this outline here, that's where the dune was, that's where the barrier island was. As we move through time from one to four, we can see that this peat outcrop that used to be behind the barrier island starts to become exposed. Right, so that gives us our clues that this, this, this barrier island is moving. Right, because we can find this layer. And lo and behold, if you go up to some place like Talbot Island, right, how many of you have been to Boneyard Beach in Talbot Island? If you haven't been there, it is beautiful, it is sort of cool, creepy. Um, you walk down there and you walk along the beach, you'll eventually run up on this stuff. This is freshwater peat, right? That's very, very thousands of years old freshwater peat. It used to be a swamp. And where are you standing now? You're standing on the beach. So that barrier island is, is receding, and that peat is being exposed to erosion. We know that whole barrier island is now moving, right? And, and this is just that great sort of walk you can take to, to prove that to yourself. And right, some other great examples. Assateague Island is one of these classic textbook examples of barrier island movement. Um, if you look to Assateague, it sits on the Maryland-Virginia border. Ocean City is uh, the developed part of the barrier island. It's been armored. So they prevented it from having really this, this, this migrational movement. And if you look to the south, this is the national shoreline. Right? So it's, it's a park, and it hasn't been hardened. And you can see that since 1850, this part has definitely moved landward. Right? And we can see it just from the way where the location of the beach is now. Um, this is the, the best image I could sort of steal from Google Earth. Right, so here's Ocean City, here's the inlet, this is the national shoreline. Um, you can see the difference in distance between this island and that island. So that's the difference between natural migration and then versus the developed, the developed prevention of migration. So we know these barrier islands all over Texas, all over Florida, are, are moving inland. 
And this is another clue that sea level is coming up, right? It must be responding to that equilibrium change. All right, but it works the other way. I'm a geologist, so I have to go back in time, right? So you go back far enough, hundreds of thousands to millions of years ago, sea levels were higher, right? Go back 150,000 years ago, we've been having this conversation in Scooby Gear, right? Sea level was higher, which means where was our barrier island? All the way that way, inland, right? And we can see that when we look at North Carolina, these are all old dune lines, right? From millions of years ago, this orange bridge scarp they think is about 23 million years old. So this is higher sea levels, so what's happened, we'll see the level dropped. As we went through our, our next glacial phase, that bare island moved out, so all these sands moved out to our modern area, and there's our modern, this yellow sort of here on the coastline, that's the modern barrier island, and it's now moving back in. So this is a cycle. We're pushing that in between different equilibrium states. There's a the picture that I did, right. So there it is, we pushed between one barrier island equilibrium state to another, right? It's moving through time, and we're pushing it through that system. All right, so what makes these things move? Um, really, the big answer here is the, the sea level. And that, and that, in itself, we think we know what sea level means, but it's really complicated. What sea level and how it changes is quite complicated. I'll walk you through that really quickly. I hope I'm not running out of time. And then we'll talk about sediment budgets, um, because well, here's sediment. Here's some of our future Jacksonville Beach sand, right, coming out of the Connecticut River, up, up in the northeast, that will eventually longshore transport down to us and agree on our beach. All right, so sea level is, is complicated, right? So who's asking what sea level is? Sea level means different things to different people. If you're an engineer, if you're a cartographer, how you present sea level is very different. So cartographers tend to pick the mean tide, right? That mean level tide, that's sea level, because that means it's either going to be higher or lower, but that's the average. Um, datums are different, right? So when you start looking at this, they're local datums, they're global datums. Um, even if you just talk to the USGS, they have NADD in three different flavors now, I believe. They keep changing it because that datum changes. So what you're measuring, what is zero, is really not an easy answer. Right? Zero on a map from 1850 is not zero on a map now. Right? And zero on the GIS shape file you stole off the internet, right? Is, you gotta figure out what zero means in that shape file, because it may not be clear. Um, so your local data matters. Sometimes if you're just running a survey on your house, or you're running a survey from a well, so the USGS does this all the time, you use a local data. Right, you use a local piece and you try to tie it into something else, but that may not jive with something else, something bigger you're dealing with. So when you're dealing with seal, you have to think about what datum you're using. Um, we have these things called, oh, we have these things called the mean surface, sea surface levels. Um, they're global, but even those are not always in agreement with each other. So you need to take care when you're, when you're talking about what sea level is. All right, so sea level's not an easy thing to think about. Because on top of that base level, we have all these other things that add height and remove height from sea level. Um, so steric height, this is a physical oceanographic fancy term for the elevation of water, which is not even. The ocean is not flat. It goes up and it goes down. Mountains underneath the ocean will actually raise the water level because the gravity pulls water towards the mountain that's sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor. That's how we know it's there from satellites. It raises it a few centimeters. Right, so this, these minute changes of steric height, in this case, this, this high of water here in the, in the Western Pacific, this is a gyre sort of pushing water to the center. It's mounding water in the middle of that gyre. So that sea level is, is higher just from that steric height. And we're finding out more and more that steric height's changing. As the currents slow down, the Gulf Stream seems like it's slowing down. We're not moving as much water through the Gulf Stream as we were 30 years ago which means the water we're pushing to the center of our, our eastern Atlantic gyre is going down. So that's something we have to keep an eye on. What else is changing? Well, tides, right? We think of this, this is overprinted on top of our sea level, and this is probably one of our, 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 our biggest concerns because it happens every day, right? And it happens on a monthly basis. So we have to think about tides. But you have to remember that most tides are measured from mean low, low water. So we have to think about where in the tide you're looking at and how that tide's changing. What's your tidal range where you are? Um, and then there are changes in how close we are to the moon, how far we are from the moon, um, how 
close we are to the sun, how far we are from the sun, all those things are going to change our tidal heights. So remember the king tides, that's one of those famous terms now, especially if you live in Miami. Right, king tides are happen at certain times of the year when everything sort of lines up just the right way to give you an extra high, high tide and an extra low, low tide. Um, even St. Augustine started to think about this, right? Because we're starting to see water in places we didn't see it before. Because the systems we designed to drain water out of our cities were built in the 40s, in the 50s, sometimes in the 30s, for a very different sea level, right? And if you gravity drain, the level of the sea isn't the same anymore that gravity is going to behave very differently than it does, than today than it did in 1940. Right, so this is, this is one of my favorite ones because I'm a geologist. Right, so this is the long-term view. There are other things that we don't even think about. That ice sheet that sat on top of Wisconsin and, and Canada, we're still feeling the effects of the removal of that ice sheet. I, I try to tell people the surface of the Earth is a lot like a, this is a weird analogy, so bear with me, a rubber sheet sitting on top of a vat of honey. Right? It's hard to picture. It's a lot, right? But when you press on that sheet, the honey pushes out of the way, and you remove your hand, and what happens? You can see your handprint for like a few seconds, and then it re rebounds, right? But it rebounds slowly. The crust is still rebounding from that removal of that ice sheet. So this blue part of the U.S. is rising. Because it's like if you've ever sat on a waterbed with your friends, and they all sit on one side, and you sit on the other, all the weight goes there. What do you do? You go up. Then they all get off, and you go down. Right? So this part of the U.S. was pushed down. It was actually, sorry, it was flexed down, so it's rebounding. And look at the reds. These are our vertical movements that are actually negative. Uh, Washington, D.C. is going down. New York is going down. Fortunately, it acts like ripples. So Florida is, we're actually winning a little bit. We're, we're, we're rising a few millimeters per year because we were flexed down during the Ice Age, so we're out, actually the whole rock of Florida is rebounding. Um, the interesting part is, and this is my geologic take on this, the rock sitting underneath Florida is not the same as Georgia. We are sitting on top of oceanic crust that used to be attached to Africa. Right, so if you're from Florida, you're actually from Africa. Because we got glued on the continent, right, and you go north of here, it's past the Suwannee Line, into Georgia, you're in continental North American crust. If you're standing in Florida, you're in basaltic crust. So Florida already, it's underpinned by basalt, sits a little bit lower in the mantle compared to Georgia. There are all sorts of weird things that come up when you start looking at some of the, the structure of places like Florida. We're actually very interesting, an interesting place to live. All right, so another thing. This is the one that, that I just read about only months ago, right? Gravity. Gravity is, I, I was a geophysicist, I made these sort of maps, but I didn't clue in that water is attracted to big gravitational masses. The Greenland ice sheet is so big and so massive, it actually gravitationally attracts water to it. So the sea levels around Greenland are slightly higher because of that, that mass. And what happens when that mass is gone? It's going to revert back. So we're going to see a sea level adjustment just from where these masses are, the Andes. Right, big mass attract water to them. So the water levels in South America are slightly higher because the Andes are sitting there. So that these big picture things also affect what we think of as sea level that are affecting our plants in the future, just the way future, right? So your, your actual sea level has all sorts of components to it, things that are overwritten on top of that sea level. So we can think of sea level as a baseline when we add in all these sorts of changes on top of it. Some of them are time variable like tides, some are long term like geologic, and some are climatic, right? Steric height is going to change the climate changes, ice mass is going to change whether climate changes. So when we think of this, just remember that whatever you think your, your height is, you have to start taking into account all these different pieces. And then you add in the really short term things, right? Like storms. Those are really hard to track. So things like hurricanes, how often do they happen, the frequency starts to become very interesting when you're adding on top of all of this. Right? So what do, what do, what do storms do to tides? What do they do to, to water movement? Um, these are all imprinted on top of these longer term items. OK, so just to look at some, some sea level rise, um, this, is, this is now an old slide. I need to update this. But it's very interesting still. Um, our projections are all about right. 
right? We're, the, the, the tide gauges are all following along, unfortunately, the highest of the IPCC projections. We know sea level's rising, we think it's accelerating, right? We know some of the things, ice mass changes affect that. Some of these bigger problems affect that. Um, but I also want to point out that all these things in print, but sea level isn't changing the same everywhere. Right? Some places are going to see bigger steric changes, some are going to see less. Right? If you go to some place like Alaska, it's a unique case, sea level is actually dropping. Because Sitka, Alaska is actually going up. Right? It's a convergent zone, it's actually lifting up, so it's having problems with the fact that its harbors and its docks need to be continually extended because the land is actually coming up. Um, so there are unique things that happen around the world that we need to think about. Go to Galveston, Texas, sea level is rising really fast, in part because of sediment loading. The whole crust is starting to get pushed down from the amount of sediment coming out of places in Texas and, and Mississippi. All right, so let's get to, to the coastal process and beaches in my last few minutes. All right, I want you to think of this equilibrium state again, and, and our, our classic active sand beach. Um, the way it's supposed to, what we, what we learned in 101, how this is supposed to work. Um, during the winter, the storms erode sand away. Big storms erode sand. You remove sand out of that checking account, right? It comes out of your berm. That storm berm and that part that we think of as dry during the summer that you lay your towel down on and you bathe, right? That's the part that disappears and it slumps back into this near shore area in terms of bars, right? So it's stored just offshore. And then during the summer, it gets pushed back onshore and you rebuild the beach, right? So that general summer, summer action in, in sort of contrast builds your beach up. Um, you dig into this dune system during your really big storms, right? It's still part of your, your monetary budget, but it doesn't often get used, right? But it is available there to protect the, the, the place behind it, um, and it will move sand backwards. So think of this sort of classic way. This is how beaches normally function. But what do we do? We tend to build on that dune system. Again, because it's, it's beautiful. It's a nice place to live. But we got to realize that we're now part of the checking account of that beach system, right? So it's going to remove sand, unfortunately, from around your house, put it back into the ocean because that's the natural way it moves sand to and from the beach. So keep that in mind as we sort of move forward. So this gets into the what do we do about it. So there's some, some answers that have been engineered out there. We're going to run through them really quickly. They'll be really general. Um, and some things we may think about. So things that we do, we can build things like groin and groin fields. Um, look at jetties and breakwaters very briefly. This happens to the <clears throat> marina. Um, we tend to build jetties and breakwaters. And then things like seawalls. So what do, what do groin fields do? Um, they trap sand. And they're designed to trap sand. Right? So the longshore transport builds the sand up on one side of this groin. Um, they tend to be built out of all sorts of things like riprap or, or concrete or fill. Um, they trap the sand, but you can see that on the other side, if you, if you own a house here, you're happy at the beach. If you own a house here, not so happy. Your beach doesn't get the same budget of sand because it's being trapped on the other side of the groin. So they tend to build groin fields, right? So we tend to try to trap sand and rebuild beaches. Um, this, is, this is why we build groins. Um, if we build jetties, and this, I throw this in because the jetties off of, of Jackson are a great example of this. Look to the north side of the jetties, it's open water. Look to the south side of the jetties, it's Mayport Naval Station. Right? Partly that's engineered, but partly that's the sand that doesn't make it, that, that moves past that jetty and gets put deposited down to it. Um, so when we tend to armor coastlines, especially up in the northeast, uh, lots of growing fields, California, lots of growing fields, um, we're changing the transport, that we're stopping that river of sand. In other words, we're adjusting its movement. All right, so breakwaters, um, only talk very briefly, these are, they tend to build and protect uh, marinas. Um, again, they'll trap sand around the marina and they, they, they break that wave action. That's the whole point of building one of these. Um, so that brings us to this, this last one, the most popular is probably seawalls. Um, seawalls, they're designed to armor the coastline to protect the development, so you put a seawall in, you drill it down to the ground. There's some, some advantages. It protects that particular patch of area, right? It protects it from that, that coastal erosion. Uh, but one large storm, as we've noticed, right, can remove the entire budget of sand out from in front of that seawall. And here's the problem is once you've removed that protective sand in front of the seawall, 
the waves can attack underneath the seawall. And what happens is eventually the, the wall begins to, unless you maintain it and maintain the sand in front of it, will start to scour out underneath that seawall and the seawall itself will collapse um, and you end up with problems. Um, these are also problematic because it, they, they interfere with some of the natural beach properties like turtle nesting, bird nesting, things that are, are relying on that sand being there. Um, and we see that these storms, like Irma, right, can remove large amounts of sand. So what I want you to think about, what, what, what else could you do? So here's relocation is another possibility. This is what, what the U.S. government's doing with a lot of their coastal sites. Things like the, the, the Nantucket um, lighthouse was moved backwards um, just to remove it from the erosional surface back into a system where it, they don't have to worry about it for a while. Um, so with this, I know we, we think we've got it bad. Um, you could live in California, which is an erosional system, right? Where, where you're actually just losing whole sections of land because that's what happens. Um, so if you think you have it bad, try putting your multi-million dollar house on a cliff, right? And that cliff is going to disappear. It's only a matter of time. So think about this in equilibrium states. I want you to think about this when you're, when you're listening to speakers today. Ask questions. Go home and think about this because you're sitting in equilibrium right now. And that equilibrium is changing, right? Everything we have indicates we're moving to a new pocket in all sorts of ways. I want you to think about what that new pocket might look like and how we might be comfortable in that pocket, right? Okay, well thank you for listening.